studies and also a journalist. Uh, and it happens for me to have an entrepreneurship economics course at the university. And I want to share a few thoughts on my perspective upon this subject, uh, opinions with which I start my lectures I have my students. Uh, I always tell my students at the beginning of this course, Entrepreneurship in Business, particular name, with uh, this phrase, my beloved, I have a short and a long version of the course. The short version of the course is as such. If you hope to receive from me the perfect recipe uh, for having success in business, do not look at me. Go away. I have no such a thing in my pockets and my mouth will remain shut with respect to the pure and perfect success in business endeavors. I say goodbye and I re-enter the classroom and start with the longest version of my course in which I try to discuss about common sense economics for entrepreneurs. <coughs> Um, I always tell them that despite my inability to teach them about entrepreneurship as it should be done, because I'm not an entrepreneur. In fact, I work in a public university. I work in a uh, mass media environment which is more or less tied with public authorities. And it's not... Uh, a serious task for me to play as an entrepreneur and deliver insights from the entrepreneur world. But I tend to tell them that for being a decent entrepreneur, you should have the three vitamin C's uh, with yourself when, when approaching this uh, subject and approaching this eventual career for, for, for yourselves for them as uh, my students. The first one is common sense economics. Uh, I try to give my best in this respect. This is the only thing I'm uh, good at, at least reasonable, reasonably good at. Uh, you have to be, uh, you have to have compass in life, an ethic and moral one, because entrepreneurship is among many things about calculation but as well as the decency uh, the sustainability of an entrepreneurial career has very much to do with how you act in life not necessarily in terms of calculated finance but uh, in terms of ethical behavior uh, the third aspect is that you need to be courageous. Uh, you have to take risks. You don't have to wait for someone to support you or bail you out when you're in trouble. And the fourth C is try to be creative. Uh, as far as these four C's are, are involved, I, I, I tend to be very good at the last one, and being creative, because it needs to be extremely creative to find always good excuses 
for not leaving the public environment and starting your own business. So this is me, Otavion Jora, Vipers University of Economic Studies and journalist at Economy School Magazine. Uh, I will uh, briefly introduce the, the, the panelists. I will start with Mr. John Chishon, CEO at John Chishon Ventures. Uh, I will briefly uh, say a few words about him. Uh, then the panelist, uh, distinguished panelist, Mrs. Barbara Korn, Director of Austin Economic Center, Rabu Shimandan, Republican Institute and University of Polytechnic of Bucharest, and Otavia Badescu, entrepreneur and founder of Same Day Courier. Um, in a few words, uh, please let me uh, bring uh, some, I hope, relevant infos about uh, the speakers from tonight, and the uh, usual disclaimers apply when, uh, when uh, uh, having this introductory remarks. If I <coughs> happen to be correct with regard to their presentation, it's all my merit for being a well-documented journalist. If there's something wrong, this is definitely something wrong with my documentarists providing this information. So, Mr. John Chisholm has three decades of experience in as an entrepreneur and CEO investor. In 1997, he founded and served as CEO and chairman at Customer Set, now part of Confirmit, a leading provider in enterprise feedback management, a pioneer in online marketing research. He earlier founded and served as CEO <coughs> chairman of Decisive Technology, now part of Google, publisher of the first desktop and client server software for online surveys. Earlier, he worked at GE, HP, and uh, Xerox, I think it's General Electric, Hewlett Packard, and Xerox. Okay, good innovation. He's a member of the Development Committee of MIT Corporation, Board of <coughs> Trustees, and a trustee of the Santa Fe Institute and of <coughs> the Standing Institute. He holds a BS and MS degrees in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science from MIT, and an MBA from Harvard Business School. Uh, he will uh, present a very challenging approach on what Europe should learn from the Silicon Valley. This day of the chairings are few, I each in Bucharest, Multumes Kuma in Vitat. In the first half of 2001, the dot-com bust, I would often wake up in sweat-soaked sheets sticking to my skin. Customers had second round of financing, which had long been planned for that January, had refused to close despite a flurry of meetings while we ran out of cash. Those nights I would shower, get up, and try to get back to sleep. When my executive team and I finally realized that the Series B round was not going to close, we huddled to decide what to do. First, we cut our own salaries, and then several weeks later, those of all of our employees, by 10%. I cut my own salary and that of my chief financial officer by 50%. Debating and agonizing over every individual, we laid off 40% of our workforce. In our all-hands meeting immediately after, as I explained to our remaining employees that this was the only way we could keep together and stay afloat, my composure collapsed and I broke down sobbing. Our employees stood stunned, sympathetic, and embarrassed. After many consecutive quarters of profit and growth, our revenues had dropped that first quarter of 2001 by a whopping 20% quarter over quarter. Our first customers to stop paying were themselves dot-com companies like High Flyer Web Van would file for bankruptcy in just 16 months after their initial public offering. Later, even Fortune 500 companies discontinued our online survey services or simply stopped paying. To help us get through, one of our Series A investors lent me $300,000 for but not to the company meaning that I, the CEO and founder, would be personally liable for repaying the loan. The cash would last us 90 days. Later, I would pay back the investor, to whom, despite the arrangement, I was deeply grateful by mortgaging my townhouse. 
The next quarter, our revenues fell again. To make payroll this time, we factored receivables, a constantly maneuver, and cut salaries by an additional 10%. I reduced my salary to the minimum wage, which was the legal limit. Our company moved into the second floor of our building and rented out the more attractive first floor to another startup. That company quit paying us rent after three months, came in late one weekend night, cleaned out their offices, and disappeared without a trace. After that nightmare of the first half of 2001, we could finally see profitability ahead in the, fourth, in the third quarter. Then, on September 11th, terrorists viciously attacked U.S. targets, including the World Trade Center. Enveloped in smoke, dust, and debris, the twin 110 floor stories crumpled and collapsed. With much of the U.S. Northeast communications grid down, just accounting for all of our employees took hours of emailing, phone calling, and pleading to know who had heard from whom. Our VP of sales was marooned in London, unable to get back to the United States. Uh, our client invited him to stay at their home. The next day, I was finally able to broadcast the message, all customer sat employees are safe. We did not make a profit in the third quarter, but despite everything, we did at least break even. A milestone quiet relief. A very small profit followed in the fourth. The going stayed tough through all of 2002 and the first half of 2003, during which time we didn't hire a single new employee. But we made it through, growing and staying profitable almost every quarter until the company was acquired in March of 2008. Silicon Valley has been a thrilling, turbulent, challenging, and rewarding place to work these last 30 years. Unlike centuries-old London and, or New York or, or uh, Bucharest, Silicon Valley is barely 75 years old, yet is home to such familiar names as Apple, Google, Facebook, HP, Intel, Genentech, Salesforce, Twitter, Yelp, and thousands of others. In 2014, the top 150 companies alone in Silicon Valley represented $780 billion in revenue, billion dollars, U.S., $128 billion in net profit, up 24% year over year, and just under $3 trillion in market cap, up 22% year over year. It accounts for one-third of all VC investment in the United States. All of this in a narrow peninsula of suburbs about 50 miles long and five miles wide, excluded wooding, wooded foothills bounded by San Francisco to the north and San Jose to the south. Can the phenomenal growth of Silicon Valley into the number one high technology center of the world provide any, any insight to the EU? I think it can. In the last 30 years, I've worked there for large companies like HP and Xerox, founded, grown, and sold two small software companies, co-founded a third. Uh, so my thoughts about economics and government are not those of a politician or scholar, but rather of an entrepreneur and practitioner. First to understand is that Silicon Valley has arisen organically and unpredictably over eight decades. Silicon Valley's first major high-tech company, Hewlett Packard, spun out of Stanford in the late 1930s. Over time, the region attracted other companies and entrepreneurs. Most of these failed. Some of them prospered, and a few, very few, grew large enough to spin off new companies and entrepreneurs themselves. A parade of innovations, technical instruments, semiconductors, computers, software, biotech, internet, and mobile devices followed one after another. Growth comes from the few companies that survive and grow, and these, these are a small minority of the companies that are founded. Though Silicon Valley may appear to be a smoothly working engine from afar, it is anything but up close. Silicon Valley was not designed or planned, nor could it have been. So the first lesson for the EU would be, don't try to design the economy. Let people be free to initiate and innovate let them keep the rewards of their innovations and let the economy emerge from the bottom up. In her book, Regional Advantage, Silicon Valley versus Route 128, MIT and Berkeley professor Annalise Saxinian asks why Silicon Valley overtook Route 128, the high-tech industrial region surrounding Boston, Massachusetts, 
which got started decades before Silicon Valley. Just as Silicon Valley has two world-class universities, Stanford and Berkeley, so does Boston have Harvard and my alma mater, MIT. But there are important differences. First, while Route 128 had a tradition of lifetime employment, job hopping is more common in Silicon Valley. So knowledge and expertise flow more freely. Second, while Route 128 was highly vertically integrated, with companies like Honeywell, Digital Equipment, Wang, and Prime, computer companies that made everything from disk drives to CPUs. Silicon Valley companies were more atomic. Separate companies made disk drives and separate companies could terminals or operating software and microprocessors, disk controllers, and network software. So more entrepreneurs can try more possibilities, in effect, conduct more experiments at the same time. Knowledge and expertise not only flow more easily, but with all of these experiments and companies, knowledge recombines and new knowledge is created more rapidly. There are also more opportunities for companies to partner with each other and self-organize. And competition is more direct at a smaller scale and more intense, so selection takes place more rapidly. Most of Boston's computer companies have long disappeared. Those vertically integrated companies may have enjoyed economies of scale, but they were not able to adapt when computing shifted from mainframes and minis to PC networks, and much less so from PC networks to mobile devices. In contrast, the distributed networks of component suppliers and systems integrators in Silicon Valley were more flexible and could more readily adapt as market conditions and technology changed. Interestingly, in an era of accelerated technological change, economies of scale seem to be less valuable and resilience to change a more valuable competitive advantage. So the second lesson for the EU would be that free movement of people, products, and ideas is good, but that centralizing ever more decision making in Brussels, the EU may similarly risk making Europe less able to adapt and less resilient. Two other factors contributed to, to contributing to Silicon Valley's success are a history of successes and an acceptance of failure. Having worked for at least one failed startup is so common it is just not a big deal. Failure is a fast way to learn and having one or more failures before your first success is very probable. Everyone's heard of the huge IPOs like Facebook and Google but realize that for every visible, very visible liquidity event like those, hundreds of smaller liquidity events spread wealth very broadly across the region. This has given rise to both a vibrant venture capital industry and tens of thousands of smaller scale angel investors like me who help get new companies off the ground through small scale funding. So another lesson for the EU would be don't protect declining or unsustainable companies or industries. Let the companies be sold or closed down and the capital reapplied to the best and most promising opportunities, which are constantly changing. European ministers and administrators often talk about creating the next Silicon Valley in their country. They may plan to provide immediate tax incentives or invest in one or more carefully targeted high-tech industries. I call these measures economic theater, window dressing, a Potemkin village. Such superficial me measures make officials look good and make the public feel good. But with the exception of a very few very general trends, like Moore's Law, which states that processing power tends to double every 18 months, no one can predict how technology will evolve and when. Growth can happen exponentially and suddenly as with Google and Facebook. Differences that are imperceptible today can lead to large differences in outcome tomorrow. Who would have guessed when Apple was on the brink of bankruptcy in 1997 that it would go on to become the most valuable company in the world? Or that Solyndra that had over half a billion in government loans would go bankrupt? Venture capitalists are very well informed and have much skin in the game yet still typically lose money on six out of 10 investments. 35 years ago, IBM and, and 20 years ago, Microsoft were accused by the US Justice Department of having a monopoly. Today, no one would so accuse them of being monopolies. Despite that, Google is being accused of being a monopoly today. 
If history is any indication, that case will similarly become ludicrous while discovery is still underway and purported rem rem remedies are still being evaluated. So the next lesson for the EU is don't try to pick winners and losers and don't punish the winners. The market will pick the winners and losers and will punish the winners if and when they deserve to be punished, namely when they no longer deliver the best value to their customers. Finance ministers sometimes talk about getting a few major tenants in an industrial park or subsidizing classroom training for the jobs of the future. But a few individual high-profile companies do not an industrial ecosystem make. And as we saw with the failure, failure of the Skokol, Skolkovo Innovation Center near Moscow. And most of the jobs that will be in demand five years from now have not even been created yet. And the training isn't taking place or won't take place in classrooms, but will be free of charge provided by online uh, course of pro suppliers like Coursera, Code Academy, UDC, Udemy, or by word of mouth. In most respects, starting a new company has become easier since I started my first company in 1992. Software has become more functional and smart, smarter. You can outsource entire departments. You can use the internet to find customers and suppliers around the world. Just one thing has made starting a business harder, in my view, and that is regulation. Two examples from the US. First, the limits on H-1B visas limit the number of skilled programmers who can move to the US from overseas creating a shortage that artificially inflates salaries. And second, satisfying the US Internal Revenue Service that a contractor is a contractor often requires a tax specialist or attorney or having another firm hire the contractor as an employee and contract that person to you. A significant management burden and expense in either case, especially for a first time entrepreneur. In my book, I cite statistics of how regulation is gradually reducing the number of entrepreneurs and startups and creating a drag on unemployment. That book is called Unleash Your Inner Company. It'll be out in October. I understand that as of last year, the EU was promulgating an average of 17 new regulations every day. Not good. Why are there so many startups in mobile apps but relatively few in pharmaceuticals, aviation, construction, consumer banking, and medical devices? Because mobile apps are less regulated. Regulations raise barriers to entry, strengthen the agencies that administer them, further entrench the positions of existing players, and increase the capital required of new market entrants. Deliberately or otherwise, entrepreneurs avoid making uh, more regulated industries in favor of less regulated industries. Over 100,000 mobile apps compete today in the health and fitness segment alone. Few of these crowded apps will survive. Regulation has turned what should be a highly positive sum environment into a zero or negative sum environment. If even a fraction of these entrepreneurs could be free to address the myriad of opportunities in pharmaceuticals, aviation, construction, consumer banking, or medical devices, those fields would see much more rapid advances and humanity would be much further ahead than it is today. So my final lesson for the EU is, don't make the same mistakes the US has by gradually escalating regulation and gradually stifling innovation. Creating a Silicon Valley is not like growing crops on a farm. It is much more akin to a natu the natural growth of a dense, profuse jungle. A jungle has no design at all except the right climate and environment to let it grow. Similarly, the US and EU need to put in place or maintain the right climate and environment. Protection of private property, free trade, minimal taxes and regulation, and sound currency, what I call the Adam Smith rules. And it takes decades, not years. So we need to put, start putting in place the right climate and environment today. Permanently create tax environments that attract entrepreneurs to the EU and enable them to keep more of their gains than they could keep anywhere else in the world. It may take years before entrepreneurs even believe that the changes are genuine and long term, so don't delay in making such commitments and be prepared to keep them for uh, decades, not just years. I often say that whatever a country's ranking on the World Freedom Index is, set a goal of cutting that rank in half 
in five years by the year 2020. So if a country is at number 100 today, make it a goal to be number 50 by 2020. If it is number 20 today, make it a goal to be number 10 by 2020. Eliminate deficits that raise the cost of private debt and squeeze out private borrowers. Ensure that the private sector grows faster than the public sector, which must be provide, supported by the private se sector, and eliminate regulation. In summary, let's support the EU to the extent that it ensures free trade, labor, and movement. Let's challenge or oppose the EU to the extent that it centralizes rather than distributes decision-making, imposes regulations, and tries to control the complex, dynamic, and unpredictable economy of Europe from the top down. Thank you. Allow me also to thank you, Mr. Chishon, on behalf of the audience for your extremely interesting presentation. And uh, while listening to you and the lessons that uh, Silicon Valley might have for the European Union, and looking at uh, the next presentation we'll have today, um, it came into my mind a, a, a very interesting relationship that was developed in history between information technology and government's confidence in their powers to regulate and rule the societies. Um, I remember that at the end of the famous economic calculation debate, which took place between basically the Commissus Free Pike on one side and the, the side of Mark Freedom and uh, uh, Oscar Lange and Abba Lerner on the side of the possibility of devising a society that could be fully planned from the, from the center. Technology was uh, the ultimate convenient god that was brought to the table of debate. Uh, the socialists believed that society was not sufficiently informationally and technologically mature to process, to assess and process the immense quantity of information that was needed to devise the exquisite plans that the socialists promised for the societies. And once the technology was sufficiently mature, the problem of economic calculation planned from above, from bottom up, will be resolved as such. Um, I'll will dare to uh, challenge you with uh, this thought in, in the Q&A session, whether technology would be rather an ally for governments or an ally for free markets in their never-ending thought fight. Uh, next in line in our uh, panel presentation is Mrs. Barbara Korn. She is president of the Friedrich Hobbes von Hayek Institute in Vienna, Austria, and director of Austin Economics Center. Being a worldwide networker, she uses these abilities to promote free market policies. In addition, she is a frequent speaker on public policy related issues, especially on the regulation and education <coughs> topics, the future of Europe and Austrian economics. Barbara Korn is an associate professor of Austin Economics at the University of Colonia Gorica, Montenegro, and a member of the Board of Business Consultants of the Austrian Federal Economic Chamber and a member of the Montpellier Society. She is president of the European Center for Economic Growth. She's a strong supporter of individual freedom. She promotes free policies in Europe and around the world. Dr. Krohn criticizes the EU democracy and stands towards uniformity and predicts that you will drastically change in the next 10 years. Not surprisingly, she poses the EU's common currency. Uh, I'm delighted to find out that there is still making Austrian economics in Austria. Mrs. 
I work from here. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I bring back the Austrians to Austria at home, but we also defend them abroad. And when you started with the calculation debate, uh, luckily uh, the socialists have failed and, and, and communism went down, but uh, Hayek and our friends would turn around in their graves uh, if they saw uh, what is happening right now, uh, eventually after the uh, financial crisis, the so-called financial crisis, since they ignore the business cycle theory. Um, the pendulum swung back and, and brought back all the negative um, impacts and, and uh, the last panel has already discussed a, a, a couple of those and, and John pointed out some, th some of those. So since this uh, panel is about entrepreneurship and its enemies, I would simply say government is the enemy. Government is the enemy. And if we rely on subsidies or if we as entrepreneurs, and I've been my, an entrepreneur my entire life, I've always been self-employed, I've never uh, I never want to be dependent from somebody else, so I love individual freedom and my freedom, and I want to defend it by all means. So if we as entrepreneurs take subsidies, we are as corrupt as those people that we were talking about in the last panel. We should not do that. We should not do that. After all, being an entrepreneur means to be able to take risk, to be self-responsible, and by that also responsible for those families, and as John pointed out so nicely in the 2001 year, and trust me, I've had those nights as well, um, when you just don't sleep because you are afraid, how do you pay, how do you make payroll? And you rather not pay yourself than, hide, uh, than fire somebody from your team. So these are things that uh, every, each and every entrepreneur sees, fears, and goes through every day. So this is why we just want to be left alone and do not want to have anything to do with government. The best incentives government can provide us with is let us do our job and not bother us, neither with regulation, nor with high taxes, nor with other negative consequences. But I would like to... Um, draw your attention a little bit, not only to the characteristics that an entrepreneur needs to have, and since you pointed out so nicely at the beginning, you cannot teach entrepreneurship. You can provide the right tools to students to give the, to give the right framework, like you, know, you need to know the budget, to how to read a budget, how to write a budget, how to calculate, you need to know, to know the laws, etc. These are all things that you can learn, but the rest is values and is a question of your own character and of how you drive yourself. I mean, if you don't believe in the achievement principle, if you don't believe in competition and self-responsibility, you are not to become an entrepreneur. Full stop. That's it. Um, and of course, you also have to take into account that each and every entrepreneur can fail, and it's not bad. It's it's not it's not a tragedy if you fail if you go bust. This is not a problem. The problem is only if you make the same mistakes twice. And this is something that we as entrepreneurs need to learn. So let me come up with a couple of figures and numbers that, you know, it's not only that, uh, but we also need a little bit to theorize theory. Um, first of all, I would like to say that today's startups will be the backbone of our societies next, uh, in the next generation. Because those startups are the so-called Mittelstand that we see uh, create wealth in all our societies. Those people pay taxes. And they create jobs. It's not the government who create jobs, by the way, but I think you all know that, at least after the last session. Um, so this is a very important thing. But if we look, uh, if we look up in the numbers, those early stage entrepreneurs um, survive uh, only 2.3% of Italy's adult uh, population. So it's only 2.3% in Italy that want to be or that, that are survivors in the entrepreneurial jungle if you become self-employed. In Germany it's 4.2%, in 
In France, surprise, surprise, it's 5.8 percent. I will never have believed that, but it's obviously due to the bad economic situation and the high unemployment rate that many people uh, flee into self-employment or become the famous Uber drivers um, who are now driving the economy in, in many places. But um, there are other countries in the world, for example, in, in the United States of America, where we only have 7.6% uh, that survive in the first years, but China and Brazil are the, are the best countries uh, when it comes to entrepreneurship. It's, uh, in China, it's 14%, and in Brazil, it's 17%. Um, and the famous America, the country of, uh, of, of uh, success, where the dishwasher, the story of the dishwasher who becomes a millionaire, a billionaire. Um, this is not true anymore. Um, many things have changed and those have been pointed out by John already. But I would just like to come up, there are six million business owners, small, small business owners, so these mom and pop shops. Um, and uh, many of them lose their business and have lost their business due to those many regulations that have uh, come up in the recent years, especially by the Obama administration. And just to give you another number, and then I stop with figures, um, 3.8 million have, of these 6 million have fewer than four employees. So it's all really small and medium-sized companies. It's those garage shops, it's those mini cafeterias, it's, it's those people uh, who are your next door neighbor, who make the difference and who pay their taxes. Let's go one step back. What happened and why has entrepreneurship all of a sudden become so attractive? And why has it uh, become sexy? Um, after and during the Industrial Revolution, we saw the first companies or the first small and medium-sized enterprises rise. Growth. The second boost was after World War II. And now I think we have a third shock that we will see after the sovereign debt crisis finally bursts, or this bubble bursts. So in here I think we will have an opportunity for new entrepreneurs if we don't fall into the trap of making um, more bailouts. Um, provide more subsidies to those companies who cannot survive without government and taxpayers' money help. So this will be an issue. But I would also like to bring you to the point that when we talk about those Ubers and those many, many companies that when they started, they were worth next to nothing. Value was created just out of an idea. There was no capital involved in the beginning. It was creativity, it was a person, an individual who did not give up. And many of us in Europe thought, well, what's it, what is this? We would have to change our mindset to understand that. And this is, I think, one of the barriers that we in our, in our, in this old Europe still have in, in those frontiers, our inner frontiers, because we don't think out of the box, which is obviously possible in other environments across the pond in sunny California. And there are two more um, attributes that we need to think about. It's this mix of fatalism that I was pointing out to, and then of course the fear of competition that we, that we have in Europe. If I talk to my students, not in Montenegro, because those, this is a private university like yours and they know what competition means, but those at the State University in Innsbruck, my hometown, if I ask them, is competition good? Uh, no. It's back in, for them, it's good in skiing or in soccer, full stop. All the rest, no, no, we have to, put, to provide an, email, an even playing field for everybody. Trust me. Luckily, we are not equal. We have to be equal before the law, which is when it comes to the rule of law, but else it's good and very positive that we have different talents and that we all are unequal. And we should, we should argue for that. This is very positive. So fear of competition and, the, and admiration and a little bit of envy is always something that plays into the field when it comes to entrepreneurship. But trust me, 
I like to be envied because we are successful entrepreneurs, business people, because we spread the now I'm currently I'm a mix of a market entrepreneur and an intellectual entrepreneur. We spread the word of, of, of freedom and trust me it's it's a good feeling. And people don't many entrepreneurs, most of them actually, don't do this and don't sorry my language work their asses off twenty four seven because of money. They do it for other reasons. They do it because they love what they do, because they have a goal, because they want to achieve, and because they have a vision. And I think this is something that, that is a difference to many other people who just think in, in, in their small boxes. And since I am obviously running out of time in one minute, I quickly go through three characteristics or four that I think are very important. In subordination, you must be able to speak up and don't follow the rules and tell people if you don't like something, then you do it. You have to be a rascal. You have to really um, do what, what, uh, what others would not do and to be brave. You also have to have a notion of the social issues and social questions because if you deal with people, you have to be sensible. And this is very important for an entrepreneur. This makes a difference. This makes a difference to those cronies and real capitalists, those who take care of others, who protect their property, but also the property of their employees by providing and creating jobs. And of course, you have to be very innovative mm -hmm. and um, you have to have negotiating skills, you have to be direct, and you have also to be, you have to be a cosmopolitan as well. You know, be open. Open your eyes to the world. Learn, learn, learn. This is the thing that I think is the biggest challenge for us every day. And we have to be able not to stand still. We have to grow and elevate ourselves as well. And I think this is a difference to many other people who simply sit there and wait for government to solve their problems. And I would like to see an, a society, and especially young people, who are able to solve their problems themselves. And just do it, because you can. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Cohn, for the very spirited, Austrian spirited presentation. Um, we as uh, Austrian economists have a, like a deep respect, not only on the idea of competition in markets for goods, but also the idea of competition in markets for ideas. And this is where we witness a certain paradox, uh, truth does not always sell very well. Um, I will pass the word to the next speaker. And uh, it's nice for me to observe the fact that in Romania, Austrian economics does not necessarily mean only OMV in terms of oil business or Erst in terms of banking. But Austrian economics means the old school of common sense, which is taught fortunately in many of the economic, uh, not necessarily only economic universities in Romania. We have with us Radu Shimadan, who is a friend and, and, and a teacher in Austin economics, and a very exquisite one. He is co founder and executive director of the Republican Institute, a free market oriented think tank that works with current in prospective politicians to support economic freedom and capitalism in Romania and in the EU. He teaches economics at the University of Politecnica Bucharest, when she delivers to the country the best engineers possible, and is interested in Austrian economics and public choice in order to make them good common sense economists. Am I right?
loses the game. Okay, I think I'll have to speak to a little lower. Thank you. Uh, my presentation is, uh, is about subsidizing people to become entrepreneurs. Uh, and I think it follows uh, nicely from the previous ones. Uh, I might be a little too uh, theoretical, and uh, for this I, uh, I apologize. So, uh, we keep hearing that entrepreneurship is a good thing, and uh, rightfully so. Uh, in the words of a professor from Stanford, the entrepreneur is the single most important player in a modern economy. Uh, entrepreneurs, entrepreneurship have uh, economic and social uh, effects. Of course, it creates jobs, at least uh, this uh, it is what is said. Uh, it drives the economy, it makes the founders and investors rich in the process, and cultivates a sense of independence or uh, going your way. Uh, there are also effects on uh, the entrepreneurs themselves. Uh, people who run their own businesses have greater job satisfaction than people uh, who don't. Uh, Yes, but the typical entrepreneur taken into account uh, is a startup, uh, a company capitalized with about $25,000 of the founder's savings that operates uh, in retail or personal services, and this is the typical uh, US startup. Uh, of course, in a sense, we are all entrepreneurs, uh, meaning that we own resources, we seek opportunities, we want to give our resources the best uh, use. But, uh, in other words, everybody is doing it, uh, but we'll use a classical example of, uh, of startup to uh, make our point uh, further. Uh, so the question that comes to mind is uh, obvious. Uh, why not have more entrepreneurship? Uh, let's get volume. Uh, so we witness a volume-oriented uh, strategy, and uh, we should ask if this is uh, really a good thing. What we witness is subsidizing entrepreneurship, uh, meaning that uh, we have the government pay for the startups, in the form of uh, transfer payments or loans, regulatory exemptions, tax benefits uh, for people who start uh, businesses. So, can you have too much of a good thing? Can you have too much entrepreneurship? Uh, and there is this article by uh, Scott Shane. Uh, he's a professor of entrepreneurial studies at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland. And he asks, uh, rather, he states that uh, why encouraging more people to become entrepreneurs is a bad policy. So we have to stress the word encouraging, and uh, it is, as we shall see, encouraging by the state. And he says that subsidizing startups leads to marginal businesses that are likely to fail, that have little economic impact and generate little employment, that are likely to depend on state subsidies uh, to survive. He also uh, talks about the job creation uh, myth. He says that startups create less jobs than uh, exist existing companies also less lasting uh, jobs. Uh, he also talks about the economic growth myth. Uh, and uh, uh, his reason is as follows. Uh, who is most likely to respond to those incentives and start uh, businesses? Of course, unemployed people, uh, because their opportunity cost is low. But they tend to perform worse uh, when they start company. So uh, we have this effect called uh, 
adverse uh, selection. Uh, he also talks about uh, the substitution wage uh, businesses, saying that uh, many businesses are not uh, businesses in a real sense, but uh, they just uh, sub substitute wages uh, for profits. So, uh, his advice is that policymakers should stop subsidizing the formation of the typical startup and focus on businesses with uh, growth potential, saying that investing a dollar uh, or an hour of time in the creation of additional average new businesses is worse uh, is a worse use of resources than investing a dollar or an hour of time in the expansion of an average existing uh, business. Now, uh, of course, you can criticize this, uh, this approach, uh, saying that it is only a quantitative analysis and it applies uh, to the US case uh, only. And you may ask uh, yourself, who knows, maybe in Romania, we would benefit from uh, subsidizing startups. So I propose to take a different path. Let's uh, look at the uh, European Union case. Uh, of course, we have a lot of subsidizing uh, entrepreneurship, but when studying the European case, it is very interesting to uh, look at the terms involved and the terminology. So subsidizing in all uh, EU documents becomes uh, supporting. Entrepreneurship becomes inclusive entrepreneurship, not just entrepreneurship, or social entrepreneurship, or uh, entrepreneurship done by women or disadvantaged and uh, disabled uh, people. They uh, define the social enterprise, saying the social enterprise combines entrepreneurial activity with a social purpose. Its main aim is to have a social impact rather than maximize profit for uh, owners or shareholders. Now, of course, you uh, realize that uh, something wrong with this. Uh, also, they there is something called the Europe 2020 strategy that recognizes entrepreneurship and uh, self-employment as key for achieving what? Uh, smart, sustainable, and inclusive growth. So not just uh, growth, but something different. Now, uh, how do all these statements translate into more common uh, language? They say, in fact, something like this. Entrepreneurs should not see profit by satisfying consumers. Instead, they should follow social purposes or, or uh, raise awareness on uh, some uh, matter or other and uh, give back uh, to the community. Or uh, they say uh, something like, uh, people should be free to open and operate business but only as long as uh, they, follow, they follow the right goals. Now, you can see there are problems with this approach. Uh, profit seeking, uh, they say, is not desirable uh, from a social point of view. Uh, in one phrase, I would say that the profit uh, motive is discredited. Uh, or that there are two types of outcomes for a uh, private business that act on uh, free markets, like desirable outcomes, like innovation and economic efficiency, but also undesirable outcomes uh, like inequality, uh, discriminations against women or the elderly or uh, the sexual uh, minorities. Uh, my conclusion is that supporting specific types of entrepreneurship is uh, nothing but yet another instrument 
uh, that politicians use in the ideological battle. Uh, so there's no wonder uh, politicians like this instrument. Uh, and it's no wonder that European uh, politicians, which are uh, socialism inclined, uh, are especially fond of this instrument. Uh, so the most harm uh, done by this instrument, by uh, subsidizing uh, people to become entrepreneurs, uh, is to be found in this uh, sphere of, uh, of ideas. There is uh, this bias towards promoting some values uh, from politicians uh, who have this tool. There is a bias towards socialism, and this is a logical consequence of, uh, of the whole process. So put this instruments, instrument in uh, the hands of politicians, and you will have these results. I think there is uh, no doubt about, <coughs> about this. <coughs> so only in this kind of environment, where uh, politicians subsidize uh, people to become entrepreneurs, uh, you can say something like this. If you've got a business, you didn't build them. Somebody else made that happen. <laughs> of course, it is from uh, Barack Obama in uh, July 2012. So it is not uh, an accident. What he says follows uh, from using this kind of instruments like uh, subsidizing startups and uh, subsidizing uh, uh, private businesses uh, all, all the way after uh, they uh, had been created. Uh, I would like to uh, say something about a different strategy because we have this uh, strategy that uh, we may call supporting, which is the term that Europeans use, uh, supporting private businesses. Uh, there are there is another strategy uh, we could call getting out of the way, and Barbara uh, talked about this, uh, getting out of the way. We wish that politician just uh, got out of the way and leave private uh, businesses do their job because they uh, do it uh, pretty well. We can use instruments <coughs> like uh, one developed by uh, the World Bank, the cost of, of uh, doing business in Romania uh, <coughs> is from their uh, yearly report uh, doing business. So there are many things that the government, uh, specifically the Romanian government, can do. Uh, they can improve a lot of things, uh, but I believe that. Uh, supporting entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship by uh, paying uh, people to become uh, entrepreneurs is uh, uh, a wrong uh, plan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, your, your presentation uh, reminds me of a headache I constantly, constantly have when hearing uh, various public servant bureaucrats, government officials, ministers, so on and so forth, different kinds of politicians, uh, speaking very enthusiastically about entrepreneurship. Uh, it's like uh, um, Drinking whiskey in the name of alcohol abstinence. <laughs> Cheers. It's, we are on the verge of absurd this time, and this new speak now is the rule in what entrepreneurial culture tends to be uh, insinuated in, in, in the Romanian society as uh, a tool coming from above, from uh, wise, dense, and uh, good hearted politicians. Um, I pass the floor to um, uh, a good friend of Adrian Badescu. Uh, he is a real world entrepreneur. 
and his uh, expertise in is a very critical field for the he owns a business which is one of the main private competitors of public mailing services in Romania. I wish him in a, in a dedication I, I did on a, on a book I co-authored that uh, uh, I wish for him to spread the words of liberty in his mailing services endeavors. But I'm going to present between May and September 2013 was direct uh, of the Korea Division, purely post of Porsche Romania, the uh, public mailing service of, of Romania. Uh, he then um, occupied this position in, within a program of privatizing the management of public companies in order to make them efficient and market responsive. Uh, he's founder and CBO and CBDO of several business projects focused on national and regional development of few brands and companies in the service sector. For instance, local mobile application for Korea industry, same day Korea and field expert acting also as managing partner in this business from 2007-2009. With A plus Eastern Europe acting also as CEO from June 2008 to December 2011. Other projects he was involved in our Gift Express, Expert Flowers. He is the founder and secretary general of AOCR, Romanian Korea Operators Association. Uh, I leave him the opportunity to spread the words of reason I just spoke about. Uh, thank you very much, Octavian, and uh, thank you, Barbara, and uh, also Bogdan for uh, this tremendous opportunities to, to speak in uh, this environment uh, and at this event which is very necessary for the society as a whole I consider I don't think there are big words I would like I would wish that Octavian could talk more about uh, in his presentation in order for me to have time to calm down after uh, Radu's presentation <laughs> He has, uh, he's, uh, he had so right, but uh, you know what we saw there, so, so many low and craps provided by some thinkers, uh, just made me very nervous. <laughs> anyway, uh, <clears throat> I consider myself uh, quite a lucky guy, not only because I was invited here, but um, also because during uh, uh, my life, I had the opportunity to to see how the world is going from very many different perspectives, most of them so-called antagonistic. For example, as you may know, I'm an entrepreneur, uh, but I was not always been an entrepreneur. Uh, I was I was not uh, an employer, but also an employee. Uh, at the beginnings. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I was not always a manager, but I also had startup positions. I started from $50 monthly fixed payment. So I know I, I was in those 10% uh, lower, let's say, uh, during my life, then I arrived in uh, top 10% uh, lower, so this proves, and I have still time to go back and forth a few times, <laughs> so this proves that uh, the statistics with uh, those people who are uh, owning 1% uh, in despite of the others, you know, it's so wrong because uh, the, a person, an individual during his life, he goes, so they, they are not the same person, you know. Uh, this is uh, statistics. Uh, to, to make a joke, uh, at the uh, first uh, university year, my professor of statistics, who uh, later became the chief of Romanian statistics, told us that uh, the, the lies has uh, three stages. This is normal lie, it's uh, outrageous lie, and then it's statistic. <laughs> so, uh, on the other hand, I was investor in stock exchange, but at some point I arrived to list my own company, 
So other people invested in my company. Um, I was most of the time in the private sector, but for a few months I went on the other side uh, in the state sector, uh, I was the manager of a um, uh, courier division of a state-owned company, Romanian Post, trying to heal uh, uh, very enthusiastically to, to give a hand, you know. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Most of the time also I was in business world, but in my early youth, I was the leader of youth organization of a political party, so I I kind of had a flavor of uh, politics as well. And um, even uh, I learned the uh, economy. Um, I have to admit that uh, I was not very aware of the economic theories and uh, about uh, Mises or uh, Hayek or so on. Uh, I should have read more about it. Uh, instead, uh, I was I uh, realized that uh, we jumped to the same conclusions, but uh, me, we are practice. So after uh, I established my convictions after practice, I discovered that uh, many smarter people uh, theorized this uh, much before, you know. Uh, <clears throat> but this is uh, much better when you arrive via practice to to uh, theoretical uh, conclusions. So, all these conclusions uh, provide me some answers to the question in the topics today. How we achieve growth, how we make sustainable recovery, who is the enemy of entrepreneurship, and how we can set the creative energy free. So, we have to say it very loud and clear that the main enemy of entrepreneurship is the state. So let's be very, very clear about this. That's a very strong conviction. Is the state, is the um, uh, statist politicians, is the bureaucracy, is the over reglementation that they do, and it's also is the mentality of uh, of uh, those statist politicians create in the society because this is, it became it's more and more an, an issue. The mentality, also which is uh, favorized by what you're saying previously. So uh, I will just uh, outline uh, a bit of uh, realities of facts to to argument this uh, point of view. Uh, on one hand, we have over the last 100 years a uh, very a tremendous growth of the state. Uh, revenues um, from even I guess in the state it was 10 to 5 percent at the beginning of the last century. That's right. Okay, and now, and this all over the world, let's say we can have comparative data, but now it arrived to 30 to 60 percent, depending on the state, but roughly, right. and it, we're still counting. That's right. That's right. And in, in, in only uh, 150 years. So where do we go following this trend? I mean, we will take the change. <laughs> Mark my words, we will take the change in 30 years from now if we don't uh, spread the word uh, more uh, strongly. Uh, second, accumulating and growing public debt. Who will pay for this? this uh, and also, with the, what are now the statistics about public debt are, are not very accurate because they are, uh, they are uh, uh, comparing public debt to GDP, which is not very good. You should compare it to state revenue, not to GDP. If you want to compare to to GDP, maybe you should add public debt and private debt. Correct me if I'm wrong. But, so it's even more than uh, uh, we, let's say, know. Third, Cyprus crisis, which, let's don't forget, that was caused mainly by the states, not by the bank. I mean, there are some guys who didn't pay their debts. And uh, some other guys who made some economies and paid for this. But 
it started from states who are not paying the debt. Fourth, rising bureaucracy. Rising bureaucracy, uh, I've learned uh, recently that uh, during Obama administration, maybe to refer to the United States again, uh, over 600,000 pages were added to the, as new regulation were added to the Federal Register. You, you have something like this, a Federal Register that uh, uh, adds all the new, so over 600,000 pages in 10 years. Uh, and uh, related on uh, Romania, we can say that the Romanian public agenda, as you may notice, is not uh, dominated by issues like how do we cut the spendings of the state, but the issue is how do we raise more money to the state budget. I mean, this is what some people, even in the press, in the economic press, are doing seminars about. I mean, the conclusion is that uh, we are not on the right track. We are not on the right track. Uh, and the risk is that in, a, let's say, maximum one or two generation, we will have to deal with an exploited population, poorer, and uh, with no defense mechanism against the state aggression. So we have to, to switch toward a state which is in favor to the citizens. The beneficiaries of this kind of state should be the people who are willing to work and the people who are willing to take risk. I mean, we have to regain the state back because this has been confiscated by status politicians. So, in order to do this, we need also to, to improve the democratic system because we end up at this situation somehow gradually and, uh, and in a democratic manner. Nobody, nobody forced us. So, most probably we have to, to improve a bit the democratic system, which you remember that uh, have been not well, not been always like this. In order to, to, to move to the concrete solutions, to the practical solutions, I think we need disruptive innovations in our policies. <coughs> this disruptive innovation will not, of course, the political leaders are those who are called to implement this because from there, from there, they should come, but they will not act unless there is a public pressure on it. I mean, nobody is acting uh, by, by himself. So we need to create this kind of public pressure in order to, to, to contribute to solve this issue. Uh, During, uh, let's say, 15 years of uh, experience uh, in practical business, I arrived to the conclusion that uh, uh, the maximum efficiency in uh, healing and reforming, uh, I don't know if this the word in English, cancer, can, okay. uh, system, a very sick system, Cancerous. cancer system, it's to cut the financing. I mean, like in uh, therapy, you know, you need to cut the blood who is uh, feeding the system. So, we need to reduce the revenues of the state. Unless we are, we are moving toward this kind of goal, there is no way that this system will reform. So, from this perspective, I think minimal state could might be even stronger stronger for the people and for the people who is, uh, let's say, uh, citizens of the, of the state. Uh, we need to favor business, but not in the way that uh, Esrado told us, showed us. Uh, we need to favor business by cutting taxes, by uh, eliminating bureaucracy and over-regulations, and we need to cut public spending. Why we need to cut public spending in not, in not, not to need so many revenues to the state. And the money should stay where they belong, in the pocket of those who are creating it. And who are, those who are creating it 
are more uh, efficient, the, the best efficient in spending them. So they know what, they, what to do with them. Okay, so uh, some might say at this point, well, you discuss about cutting the revenues of the state, but you know we have so many needs in uh, this society and uh, uh, we don't have enough uh, revenues to, to fulfill what society needs. At this point we should, uh, we should address it that a legitimate, let's say, uh, issue raised. But um, at this point we should uh, rethink maybe what is the role of the state in order not to underfinance several areas maybe we should redefine what are the areas that state should focus about and which is not the state problem so uh, a question might be uh, which is the role of the state it is the role of the state to protect me from your aggression or rather aggression fine or it also, it is the role of protecting me against my own aggression on myself if I'm doing mistakes. Well, I say we cannot afford such a cost due to its limitless. We simply cannot afford to protect, to, to put on the state the role to protect ourselves from our own mistake. We need to move toward individual responsibility. So there is a lot of uh, room from, uh, for improvement on, on this, uh, from this perspective on the, on the healthcare, on the retirement system, on the minimum wage, on the uh, unemployment, you name it. Uh, so we need to decrease the areas of responsibility of the state and to pass it to the more efficient private sector along with cut, uh, tax cutting, because uh, uh, as you may notice, what is kind of a trend uh, these days, at least in Romania, we are continuing to pay taxes, for example, healthcare or, uh, or uh, even uh, uh, schools or so on, but due to the low quality services, we are paying from our own pocket additional to these services, I mean, to we go in private. I have my children in private school. If I'm going to sick, I don't go to hospital state because I will die. And I, I, but in the, make, in the same time, I'm continue to pay, which is, uh, which is not good. But the politicians like it because they remain with the revenues and we are continuing to, we are solving our own problems in a parallel system in a way. So somehow we should replace it. I mean, if I'm deciding to, to, to go in private, I should cut, okay, because I'm not consuming any resources from the state, from the public, okay. So <clears throat> another uh, issue on the, on the solution part, uh, we need to, let's say, find ways to politically penalize uh, deficit. I mean, it's like a CEO, right? So if you are continuing uh, accumulating deficits, it's not a, like a one year or something that you may be it's a continuous, huh? you need to lose the job in a way. So uh, eliminating uh, the possibility of non-balanced budget. Uh, another issue could be another let's say, uh, room for improvement is the, on the state-owned companies which we should finish with subsidizing. Or, this subsidizing, I mean, these, our, these are our own companies, let's say, right? Theoretically. But uh, if it's our own company, let's decide together if we cut the debts. I mean, transforming the debts into shares, so on. I mean, like a, a referendum. We should allow uh, cutting the debts of the state-owned company only via referendum, like a general assembly. 
this will uh, this might op open a, a new perspective on, on, on this and I don't think it will be very very easy to sell it. Uh, I've been there in this kind of uh, uh, of uh, environment let's say I can tell you that unless you are not finishing this possibility of uh, of cutting debts there is no way to reform no no state owned company you know but now you cannot just cutting debt you know very openly because there are some uh, EU regulation which says that uh, uh, you can uh, you don't allow to make state uh, help you know unless the company is in the process of privatization so what the government does let's pretend that we want to privatize and uh, we start this process with Romanian Post, we start with uh, uh, Marfa, with the, you know, we start with Orkim, we find some guys, pretend that you want to buy. You know, at the end the process is failed, but you will notice that in this process, the debts have been deleted, erased. I mean, the, the state, let's say the politicians don't want to to give up on the administration because what is most valuable than administrate something that you don't own. This is a, a structural problem because you know politics don't have its own revenue. So what, what it does, it has to rely on the revenues of the companies that that he administrate, right? So uh, it is uh, impossible. It's a it's a structural problem. It's not a managerial, it's a property problem, these uh, uh, state companies. Uh, bureaucracy, other point. We can imagine a system, for example, and uh, uh, I guess I saw it also in, uh, in uh, other parts, maybe in Canada, or we, we need to, to, let's say, allow a new regulation only uh, the initiator prove that this, at least the same number of pages from existing regulation have been eliminated. Otherwise, we arrive at what you're saying, uh, with uh, uh, 17 uh, new, new regulation each day or something, you know? So unless we make this quantitative, at least quantitative cut, I mean, you can implement whatever you want, but prove it that uh, at least the same number of pages have been deleted. It might be very efficient. Uh, last but not least, we need to give more power to the people. I mean, along with uh, the voting rights, we can uh, we can uh, empower them also with uh, a say in uh, distributing their taxes to the areas which they consider appropriate. So, I mean. Let's face it, uh, the democracy today, what, what power do we have? It's called democracy, power of the people. What power do we have if it's uh, split it in uh, tens of millions of equal units, it's uh, exercised one in four years, and it's exercised by representatives by representative who have their own representative who have no other goal than spending the resources that they don't produce. I mean... <laughs> There is a joke in terms, you know, it's uh, like many, many ideas, it's, uh, it's uh, completely, it's not democracy in, in uh, its term. Um, so all of these are uh, quite uh, difficult uh, to do. So it is, it's, it is quite difficult, but uh, I would uh, quote here uh, Nelson Mandela who, who have a say uh, that uh, nothing, no, everything seemed impossible until it's done. So it's, it's not impossible, but it's very, very difficult, correct. Uh, jumping to the conclusions, uh, what we are facing, we are facing a a welfare state that claim to take care of us. Uh, there are some uh, people who think that uh, they have the right to a guaranteed existence uh, based on taxation of others. 
and uh, the redistribution of the revenues produced by others. We have also uh, people think that restricting freedom and imposing rules on businesses uh, it will be somehow <coughs> like a, a, a saving belt for their uh, risk of, of their, their life risk, let's say. And we have a paternalistic state who uh, pretty much succeeded to change people's character. It made them uh, without initiatives and uh, passive and uh, dependent, which is uh, not very, very, very good. So uh, here comes uh, some risks along with these situations. The risk that at some point a political force in the name of the state will produce abuse over this kind of population and this abuse will su be supported in a democratic way by most of the people. If the character has been changed, this is a risk. This is a risk for business, the, men the mentality, if it, it will continue to develop in this way. So the today uh, ideological debate uh, and conflict is not between uh, Democrats, liberals, socialists, uh, popular, you name it, let's say. It's between more state or less state. That's the, the main conflict, let's say, and it's the most important battle of our generation and on the future generation. So, there is a, this ideological debate between ever-growing uh, ever government versus pioneer spirit, let's say. And this kind of events, like free market roadshow, uh, ha has, has a goal to influence the outcome. And this outcome should be to, to as somebody said, uh, to get off the nanny on, on our backs, from our backs. Thank you. Free market roadshow, when uh, put against the mainstream pro governmental uh, environment in both academia and, and, and civil society, because in, in, in both dimensions, the ideas <coughs> way too friendly to the state are, are part of the orthodoxy. Um, I, I focused on, on, on four uh, workplaces. If I may so, but there are much more than uh, I am doing much more than work playing, uh, in which uh, we might accentuate our image as free market economists or image of iconoclasts. But uh, uh, remember, we are iconoclasts, but in terms of common sense, they are the heads. This is the the the, the, the play of, of, of perspectives. Um, the first idea which uh, might emerge from, from such kind of discussion is that uh, liberalism slash liberal capitalism is the most socially oriented ideology. The second one is that the division, I emphasize, division of labor produces the most genuine solidarity among people. The, the third one is that hardworking and entrepreneurial spirit are the best social protection in the world. And the fourth one is that the private entrepreneurs are the genuine public servants of the society. Here, here. Um, I will now uh, 
I will give okay. the, just one second to, to complete something, you know. From this perspective, as I, I noticed that people with our vision are usually called on uh, Facebook or on other social networks like uh, libertarians or, uh, you know, many people don't know I, even I, what I, it I, is. I prefer common sense because... <laughs> but uh, uh, considering that uh, etatism is against the social interest, I consider myself a socialist. <laughs> Yes. Um, now uh, we we got to the Q&A session, and uh, uh, the acknowledgement is uh, as follows: uh, the floor is yours, but please note that the sky is the limit. So feel free to ask whatever is in your feeling. What is, what's this discussion or whatever topic which was not yet touched on? Please. Okay. I'm referring to the debt. I'm referring to the debt that you mentioned. Uh, it's a very interesting observation uh, on a light note, but serious. In Romanian language, we do not have a term for trillion. If you look in the dictionary, it stops at we adopt the French and the French as well. Milliard. Yeah. All of that, you know, we don't have it in a dictionary. Oh yes, you can borrow from English, but technically, you, you know. So uh, you're in trouble if you go over a, a billion. Uh, uh, second, I would name uh, this uh, relationship of uh, the state helping you, you know, this relationship in Chester's, uh, actually. Uh, a Mephisto syndrome, okay? Uh, and uh, the third one, and I'm finished with this, uh, I'm done, uh, is um, why we all agree here, and you know, this seems to, for all of us here, it seems to natural things, most of the things that we say, were not the revelations, or people stop and say, my God, how come I didn't think of that, okay? It just looked like common sense, right? Why are we losing the propaganda war? Okay, and to me, it's what it is. If a person, the, the two factors are important: the in, intelligence, right, and the information. Are basically, the two factors that uh, I've seen people with Nobel Prize in whatever field and so on. Therefore, their ability to think. If nothing else, I don't have a measurement. You know, my IQ is not the problem. One. So that they will be intelligent by by, and then when we start talking economics, you know, I mean a third grade will probably uh, do a lot better. Uh, so this is a serious question. I know you do your part, you know, the magazine. I know you do, but why, generally speaking, you know, the bad guys are the bankers. The bad guys are the guys who have, you know, a little more money. This idea of being a zero sum society. If you have money, that means you're taking it from me. You know, there's no idea that a society technically grow. You know, and funny enough, a, a liberal, what well, liberal, a liberal, American liberal, let's not confuse, uh, said these words that now looks like a conservative, that a rising tide lift all the boats and the small and the big ones. You know, JFK, right? Uh, now it will be considered, you know. Uh, one of the really reactionary. Yeah. So I'm, I'm done, but I still this, this this issue is not solved to in my mind. Why are we losing this this propaganda war? Why can't we explain basically that a guy who's got sixty billion dollars and you know I envy him, right? Don't you know that this guy cannot eat five steaks, cannot drive five cars? Cannot, I mean, this money, what it does it mean? Invest them. I mean, you know, the, yeah. how, what is going to do with it? So if he invests, he's going to create jobs, right? He's going to make money, good. But if you're looking only at this part, we have to be prepared. And I, I, I had several talks with people on that respect. And this is definitely the end. But uh, one guy, I want to give you a laugh at the end. And one guy explained uh, to a friend, 
how fantastic communism is. And this guy said, well, I don't understand. I said, well, let's say you have three cars. Wouldn't you give two cars to somebody who can drive three cars? He said, yes, if I would have, I would give him. If you have three refrigerators, would you give two to another guy who said yes? And he goes and say, well, if you have three chickens, would you give two? No. So why? What chicken I have? <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll try to, to uh, begin on, on this one. Uh, part, uh, part of the answer is in human nature. But human nature has uh, many faces, and uh, we have to take the good faces of human nature because human nature can be used in a good way, let's say, not only the bad part of the human nature, let's say. Uh, and uh, the question is that uh, uh, not or should we should move the question not to why we are losing the world, the propaganda world, but how we can win the propaganda world, let's say. And uh, I, I would say here that uh, we need to explain, let's say, liberal measures, but classical liberal, not what we call now, uh, we need to explain. Uh, right-wing measures on the language of uh, structurally, basically, leftist people. So if we succeed to adapt our language and to show the bottom, let's say, uh, the, the, the common people, let's say, the average uh, uh, people that it's against his own interest the etatism is against his own interest, then this battle will be win. And you saw it, but now there are socialists who call themselves liberals. We are socialists. Because libertarians don't, they are not like, they are not like. Don't say it here. <laughs> well, I don't mind not being liked. I have a problem with that. Um, I just, don't like government redistributing the money that we all earn, which is the taxpayers' money, and then pretend that they give us a gift. And this is exactly what we see. And as long as we do not starve the bees, as long as the welfare state allows us to, or we allow the welfare state to exist, we will not solve this problem. And this is called public choice theory. I mean, this is as simple as it can get. If we only have, in Austria and many other Western, all of the Western countries, 10% of the population provide for more than 60% of the, of the income taxes. That's it. And you know, this is nothing but, you know, exchanging money. But 10 people, 10% 10 perform and the others don't. It's, as Benjamin Netanyahu once said, it's the thin man carrying the fat man. And it's, and this is the simple picture. And if we don't draw this picture everywhere, and this can be done easily in graphics, um, we will not solve the problem, unfortunately. But we fight. Well. You can show that redistribution does not help the poor. It's, it's not hard to show. And, but I agree with you. We can show over and over again these propositions. Like uh, economic growth is much more important for poor people than redistribution. Another thing. Show it. I don't know why we don't persuade. And speaking of, uh, you were a Marxist earlier, right? I was. If, if I remember right, Church would say that if you're not a Marxist when you're 20, you don't have a heart, and if you're a Marxist at 30, you don't have a head. Right? I just made it. <laughs> you don't have hope. I mean, you cannot be a little pregnant. Not a Marxist and the capitalism, it's with heart and mind. Oh, but you know, that, that's right. And one way we could improve our message is by emphasizing the Rawlsian point, John Rawls, that we believe, and we're correct, we got the evidence for it, that our power.
policies are good for the poor. So we can't be accused, as we always are, ah, you, you liberals, you don't care for the poor people. You're in favor of business, which is what we're always accused to. As if business is not for, people, for poor people. Well, that's the point. <laughs> if, you're in, if you let entrepreneurship work, then you get riches for the entire society. If I can answer the, the joke to, uh, to your very serious question, why can't the liberal camp, classical liberal camp, win the propaganda battle? Uh, my sincere question is I do not understand. And the living proof that I do not understand this process is that I still teach and try to write free market articles instead of growing chickens. Because if I understand, why can't we ever want this battle? I will go to a farm and be friendly with nature. Instead of remaining in the city trying to. Well, you tell me the truth. I mean, you know, I mean, it was actually that I wish a lot more people would take an active role to present exactly what you're talking about. That the future, that, you know, if, let's say, if the present trend of uh, globalization continue, uh, I've seen a, a, a report saying that by 2050, uh, by 2050s, half of the world population will reach a, a medium uh, class uh, status, you know, which is fantastic. In China, you know, down before the restructuring, the last, uh, they, they did about 50 million people that of uh, hunger. You know, so, well, do you have additional questions or additional answers? <coughs> uh, so, um, if any one of the panelists will like to have a final word, the final word is already said in written. Uh, I declare, I, I declare open the debate, which must go. Thank you. Thank you.